right, page 185 in your textbooks, you had questions 18 through 20 for homework last night. Number 18 says, define momentum in words and in an equation, Kendall. Momentum is, is equal to the product of its mass and velocity, and the equation is P equals mv. Good, P equals mv, product of mass and velocity for an object. Number 19, what was the original statement of Newton's second law of motion, Audrey? The original statement of Newton's second law of motion states that the force applied to an object equals the time rate of change in momentum. Very good. And number 20, what is the law of conservation of momentum, Michael? The law of conservation of momentum is that when a net force act acting on a system is zero, the momentum of the system remains constant. Good. If there are no outside forces acting on a system, its momentum is conserved. Momentum remains constant. Good. We're going to talk about momentum here in just a little bit. Let's review some things first of all. We're talking about energy, which, Kendall, energy is? Um, the ability to do work. The ability to do work. And uh, we talked about two major types of energy. Audrey? Um, kinetic. Kinetic and the other one. It's like, I don't do good with lists. I always forget one off the list. <laughs> Even when it's a short list. Kinetic and, Michael? Potential. Potential. Kinetic energy and potential energy. What's our equation for kinetic energy, Kendall? Um, K equals one half mv squared. And what about our equation for, now there were two types of potential energy we looked at because we said there's only a couple of conservative forces that make it easy for us to quantify the potential energy. Now, granted, I should include this. We talked about conservative forces yesterday. Electromagnetic force is a conservative force also, but we're not to that yet. So as far as we're concerned, for now, two conservative forces that will quantify the uh, potential energy. One of them is gravitational potential energy. Audrey, what was that equation for gravitational potential energy? Um, P -E equals MGH. And then we did have another type of potential energy, and that was elastic potential energy, and or spring potential energy, sometimes called. And what do we have there, Michael? Mm, Kendall? Yeah, I don't know. Audrey? Half, uh, Good, it looks very similar to the kinetic energy equation, but it's P sub S equals 1 half KX squared, where the strength of the spring, if you will, based on its mass per unit length, its thickness, the, the tightness of the coil, right? That strength of the spring, spring constant, times the amount of stretch or compression in the spring gives us the spring or elastic potential energy. Uh, we said that work is a transfer of energy, and therefore we can think of work class as a change in an object's energy. Work done equals the change in energy for an object. So we said that work can be thought of either as a change in kinetic energy or work can be thought of as a change in potential energy. How would I quantify this change in kinetic energy? Um, let's come back to Kendall. Remember change represented by this Greek letter delta always implies a final minus initial. Oh, oh, one half mv squared, and then minus one half mv squared, and then There we go, so one half mv sub f squared minus one half mv sub i squared. Similarly, a change in potential energy would be what, Michael? Uh, mgh final minus mgh initial. There we go. And so we can find work using either one of those equations. Now we said that um, in the absence of um, non-conservative forces, and I gave you a couple of pretty obvious non-conservative forces yesterday, what were a couple of those that we mentioned where energy is, uh, is lost to the system itself, to its surroundings, oftentimes? Friction and its counterpart through the air. Air resistance, right? Friction and air resistance, the most obvious non-conservative forces. But if there are no non-conservative forces, we said that kinetic and potential together will be conserved. So that uh, the water bottle, as I toss the water bottle up in the air, right, it loses kinetic on its way up, slowing down, but it's gaining potential. And the sum of kinetic and potential, if we're ignoring the minor bit of air resistance that may be present, 
uh, the sum of kinetic and potential stays constant. What's that term that refers to the sum of kinetic and potential energy for an object or for a system? Anyone? Mechanical. Good, mechanical energy. And so we say that mechanical energy is simply the sum of kinetic energy and potential energy. And again, we said that's true. That will be conserved if there are no non-conservative forces. Friction, of course, being the most obvious. And we said friction also, because of the thermal energy that's produced by friction, that thermal energy that then radiates into the environment and the surroundings of a system, said friction can be thought of not just as a non-conservative force, but also class as a, starts with a D, dissipative, dissipative force as well. How would I show conserve, uh, conservation of mechanical energy? Volunteer? There's an equation that showed mechanical energy being conserved. Is that uh, KE1 plus PE1 equals KE2 plus PE2? Perfect. The kinetic and potential sum or mechanical energy that you start with will equal the mechanical energy you end with at any given point in a process, again, assuming no non conservative. Forces. All right, questions on what we haven't talked about yesterday or last few days. All right, so a lot of equations to know. Fortunately, if you know kinetic energy, you should be able to figure out work as a change in kinetic energy. If you know potential energy, you should be able to figure out work as a change in potential. So these two are really kind of one and the same. These are kind of one and the same. Spring potential or elastic potential energy is new. If you know what mechanical energy is, you know its definition, then you know its equation. And the conservation just has the idea of making the two sides the same, except one side one, one side two. So shouldn't be terribly hard to memorize, but several equations nonetheless to memorize. We'll add another one with this next term in your notes, and let's talk about momentum. Momentum. Oftentimes, inertia and momentum are thought as being roughly the same thing. Right, we said that an object that is in motion tends to retain its motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So if someone is running down the hallway, and uh, then they tend to keep that forward movement unless some other force acts upon them, we would say they've got a great deal of momentum, or they have, depending on how fast they're moving, they have a certain amount of momentum. Uh, Andrew, my uh, two-year-old, almost two-year-old, uh, when I come home, he'll come running to see me, and so he comes running, he weighs about 25 pounds or so, and he comes running, or whatever you call that, on his stubby, chubby little legs, and comes running and he crashes into daddy and daddy gives him a hug. No big deal. He's 25 pounds and he doesn't run real fast. If Michael ran at top speed toward me to give me a hug, that's not called a hug, that's a tackle, okay? And I would be, um, you know, perhaps uh, damaged by a contact, okay? Uh, depending on how well I'm braced for it or not braced for it, right? Why? Well, for one thing, he's got considerably more mass. So for me to stop my son's movement does not require a great deal of force because he has so much less mass for me to worry about. We know that force is mass times acceleration. So it takes less force to stop his mass from moving versus Michael's mass, which is you know, about 10 times what my son, well, I mean, not quite 10 times, but you know, approaching 10 times what my son is, it's gonna be a lot harder to stop. Also, Michael can run a whole lot faster than Andrew can. And so to decelerate my son, since he wasn't moving at a great velocity in the first place, is not particularly hard. But to decelerate Michael, who presumably, if he were sprinting at top speed, could be a lot quicker, uh, much, much faster, right? That's going to also affect the amount of force required to stop him. We would say then that he has a great deal of momentum compared to my son, who has much less. But if we were to take the same object, Michael, now been objectified. If we took the same object, Michael, and he were walking down the hallway, it wouldn't be that hard for me to stop him, despite his greater mass. Why? He's just walking, right? Even my son, it's not hard to stop him, but if he were just walking down the hall, it's that much easier for me to grab him and scoop him up and, you know, tickle his tummy or whatever I do with him because he's a chubby little guy and he's cute. Uh, and he's mine. Um, <laughs> be a little weird if I were doing it. Anyway. Uh, but uh, anyway, so the mass of an object obviously affects not just the kinetic energy, but the mass of an object also affects the momentum that it has. In fact, we define mass as the amount of inertia an object possesses, right? And if the inertia and momentum can be roughly thought of as similar ideas, obviously it makes sense that mass affects momentum, but also the speed at which the object is moving. I discovered this when I was uh, 
driving to school, when I first moved here, um, my wife and I got married and I had a uh, Kia Optima, which is a large sedan, okay? It's not as big as an SUV or a crossover, but for a sedan, it's a good-sized car. So I was used to, when driving down the highway, you know, 65, 70-ish miles an hour, um, and I get off on the exit, I take my foot off the gas, and the car kind of keeps some momentum going around the turn. Well, one summer, my air conditioning went out or excuse me, my wife's air conditioning went out, it stopped working. And so uh, I didn't want her to have to drive a car in the summertime with no air conditioning, this is a life lesson. So being a good husband, I took the car with no air conditioning and I gave her my car. So I drove her car in the morning when it wasn't too hot out and I drove it home when it was four o'clock in the afternoon and it was, you know, 100 degrees outside. I just rolled the windows down and, uh, you know, sweltered a little bit, but I was doing it for her because I love her. She's my wife and we take care of our women. That's what husbands do. I think that's a biblical command. Husbands, love your wives. So anyway, so I took the car with no air conditioning. Well, anyway, in the mornings I'm driving 65, 70 miles an hour with some shaking and rattling of the car because it was a cheapo Dodge Neon, okay, which is about the, one of the smallest sedans that could still be called a sedan. And uh, so I'm rattling down the highway at 65, 70 miles an hour, take my foot off the gas. It's like instantly slowed down. Why? Although we were traveling the same speed, my greater mass vehicle had greater momentum that could carry it through the turn, where smaller car, although it was traveling the same speed, had less momentum. So momentum is the product, here's your definition, of an object's mass and velocity. Momentum is the product of an object's mass and velocity. We intuitively know if you're about to go into a turn, slowing down would help you to manage the turn better because you have less momentum carrying you again in that straight line at a constant speed or having that less inertia. So it's the product of an object's mass and velocity. In equation form, let's see, we need a letter for momentum. And you already know where I'm going with this, right? Momentum. Well, I can't choose M because that's mass. And capital M is used to denotate specific masses. So we go with the next best letter, P. Not rho, but lowercase p. Rho is density. P is momentum, because somebody smarter than me decided that was a good idea. And so in equation form, we would say that P, momentum, equals mass, M, times velocity, V. And there's the next question, or next equation for you to get in your notes. Do you want to note this? Mass is not a vector. Mass is just an entity, it's a scalar. Velocity is a vector which means momentum is a vector whose direction is based on the direction of the velocity. So momentum is a vector quantity. That's gonna be important here in just a moment. The direction of momentum is determined by the velocity's direction. Okay, so momentum, product of an object's mass and velocity. I want you to note the units we're gonna end up with here. Mass, of course, class is measured in kilograms, velocity in meters per, second. meters per second. And unlike other units where we took weird units and we made them into watts or joules or even newtons, nobody decided it would be a good idea to do that with momentum. You know, you think it would come up with something like mos or something, you know, momentum, is there this many mos of momentum? No, kilograms times meters per second. Just a big ugly unit, can't do nothing with it. So since nobody decided to call it Mohs, we'll roll the kilogram times meters per second. It's a shame. Look at page 178 now. Page 178. Look at the example problem there on page 178. Read it for us, if you would, Kendall. A cannonball has a mass of 18 kilograms. If it is moving along a line 20 centimeters north of east at a speed of 200 meters per second, what is its momentum? All right, to find momentum class, we use the equation? V equals mv. Notice what they did. They plugged in the m, they plugged in the v, and they multiplied. And they got 3,600 kilograms times meters per second. We do need to specify direction if direction is specified. Again, if it's no, not a specified direction, we assume positive, meaning the direction. Uh, but here they did. They said it was uh, 20 degrees north of east. So we would say that the momentum is 3,600 kilograms times meters per second at 20 degrees north of east. Easy enough? Questions? Page 185. Page 185. Look at problem numero diez. Michael, read number 10 for us. 
What is the moment of a five times ten to six kilogram airplane flying two hundred sixty five kilometers per hour in a direction of eight degrees east of south? Well, I already know the direction of the momentum class. Eight degrees east of south. Eight degrees east of south. Uh, to find the momentum, though, class, I need to use the equation. Thank you, Audrey. Class, I need to use the equation. P equals mv. And so we plug in the mass of the airplane, which it said, Michael, was? Um, five times 10 to the six. Kilograms. That's important, by the way, because if they'd said newtons, then it wouldn't actually be the mass, would it? It would be the? Weight. Weight, yeah. Uh, and then they gave us the speed of the airplane. 265 kilometers per hour. Uh-oh. Thoughts, class? We can't plug in a 265 kilometers per one hour. We have to change that in meters per second. So let's use some dimensional analysis here, Kendall. Um, one hour. Uh, minutes. All right, hour to kilometers per minute, Audrey. Okay. One minute over 60 seconds. All right, now we've got kilometers per second, Michael. A thousand meters over a kilometer. And now we've got meters per second. So let's go ahead and multiply that out. Divide it out. How many meters per second is the airplane flying class? 73.61 That's the velocity. We know the, we know the mass is 5e6. And ooh, I'm going to put that in scientific notation for sure. How much momentum does the airplane have, Michael? Um, 3.680, blah, blah, blah. E10. E who? I have E10. I do not have E10. E8. I have E8. Did you get 73.61111? Um, I kind of did it differently. My calculator does it differently. Oh. What did it do? Well, I... I'm just going to do it because I forgot. Okay. All right, so should get 3.680E10. Uh, round it off while he's reworking it. How many sig figs class? Three, so we'll round off to... E8, and what's our unit for momentum class? Not modes. All right. Did you get it now, Michael? Yeah, let me put in scientific notation. I should use this a little bit more complicated to do that. It is very complicated to do that. Yes. Okay, got it now. All right, questions on problem 10. All right, now let's consider the homework question asked about Newton's second law of motion. Remember, if inertia and momentum can be thought of somewhat the same thing, not entirely, but somewhat the same idea, um, then uh, Newton's second law, remember we said, is uh, F equals MA. But if you wanted to change an object's velocity, you would have to apply a mass to cause, or a, a force to accelerate that mass or to decelerate that mass. Well, remember what acceleration is. Acceleration is simply a change in velocity per unit time, correct? So then force, Michael, equals mass times a change in velocity per unit time, but think about it. If momentum is mass times velocity, any change in momentum would either require a change in mass or a change in velocity. Which is more likely to happen spontaneously? Change in velocity, right? Now, you can eat a lot at Thanksgiving or Christmas and change your, your mass, but that doesn't suddenly change, where velocity certainly could. So a change in momentum could be thought of as a mass times a change in velocity. Well, if that's the case, then mass times change in velocity would be change in momentum. And this is actually how Newton originally formulated his second law, is that uh, force that's applied will result in a time rate of change of momentum. Force that's applied results in a time rate of change of momentum. For our purposes, you may find it best to leave it in the m delta v over t format. So I'm going to write it both ways and have you do the same 
in your nose. That force that's applied to an object, a continuous force that's applied, will result in a time change in an object's momentum, usually resulting in a change in velocity or acceleration, which is how we typically think of Newton's second law F equals ma. Right, so there's another equation for you. F equals change in momentum over time, or m delta v over t, because that's what delta p is. Look at the example problem there on page 179. Um, it obviously, uh, it mentions the, um, has a little cartoon there of a train puffing along and a little fly trying to stop the train, and it says it's a patient fly. So the fly, if it exerts a force long enough for enough time, any force can affect a change in velocity. So the point that the word problem is about to make is the fly just has to be patient. Just keep pushing. Eventually, you will stop the train. Well, let's see about that. Go ahead and read example 12.6 for us, if you would, Audrey. If the fly just mentioned uh, can muster two negative seven newtons of force against a locomotive with a mass of 6.45 kilograms traveling at a constant 22 meters per second, how long will the fly have to continue pushing before he stops the locomotive? Assume that the force is um, producing uniform motion in the locomotive before the fly intervenes do not change. All right, now again, this is a very strange hypothetical, <laughs> but in theory, all things being equal, how much, uh, how much, how long will it take to stop the locomotive? All right, so this locomotive has a mass, it said, of what, Audrey? Of uh, uh, 6.45 kilograms. 6.45 kilograms. That mass is chugging along at a velocity of? Um, 22 meters per second. So it has a, a fair bit of momentum here. It's got quite a bit of momentum. What change in velocity class would have to be accomplished to stop the train? If it's traveling at 22 and we want to bring it to a stop, what would the change in velocity have to be? Negative, Negative 22 meters per second. The question is, how much time will it take if the fly can somehow, without getting just like splat on the front of the train, if the fly, uh, timing it perfectly, comes in and intervenes to start to push against the train. Again, it's a cartoon. It's a silly problem, but we get the idea. Produces how much force, Audrey? Um, 2.0 e negative 7 newtons. Now realize that force class is against the motion of the train. So we would have to say that this force is negative, negative. 2.0 e negative 7 newtons. I'm going to ignore the middle portion of the equation here and just say that F equals M delta V over T. And what I'm solving for is the T. What do we have to do to get T by itself, class? Um, Since it's in a denominator. Um, alternate. So the T is equal to M delta V over F. So we simply multiply the mass of the train that is attempting to be stopped times the change in velocity the fly is trying to accomplish, which is a change of negative 22 meters per second, and divide by the negative 2 e negative 7 newtons of force. And how much time will it take this fly to stop this train? 7.04 e13. That actually comes out exact. 7.04 e13, and time is always measured in seconds. Well, we can't even fathom E13. I mean, E12 is billions. I mean, this is 70 billion, 400 million seconds. What in the world is that? So let's, um, let's uh, take it down just a notch here. And let's consider this. How many seconds in an hour? Let's divide by 3,600. So we get this into terms of hours. That just seems like it would be a little bit better. What do we have? E 10. 10. That's still a lot of hours. How many hours in a day? Mm -hmm. Let's divide that by 24. And how many days of pushing on this uh, locomotive would it take the fly to stop the train? 814 million, 814, Okay, 8.14, blah, 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 E8 days. How many days in a year? 
365-ish, roughly 365 and a quarter, right? 365 days, five hours, 56 minutes, roughly. So if we divide by, well, not 365 and a quarter, let's divide by 365.24. It's a really close estimate. So divide by 365.24, this is how many years it will take. 2.23, blah, blah, blah. E6. Now remember what E6 means. It means mega or million. About two million years it would take the fly to stop the train. So you'd have to be very patient. It's not, no, this fly's not stopping the train, realistically, right? And that's, that's if the fly is even able to muster that much force, which one could question that. Um, but anyway, the point is, uh, in theory, uh, questions on how to use the equation. All right, uh, look if you would at the next example, maybe a slightly more realistic example at the top of the page. 180. And read example 12.7 if you would, Michael. How much force continually applied for three seconds must be used to stop a hockey player with 882 newton sliding in at an initial velocity of 7.5 meters per second on frictionless ice? All right, we've got a lot of numbers that are given to us here, Michael. What's the first number they give us? Three seconds. Three seconds. That's the time, time that. Um, this force is being applied, so three seconds is our time. The next number it gives us, and that's the weight of the hockey player, 882 newtons. Um, and it gives us a 7.5 meters per second, that's the initial velocity. But it says we want to do what to this hockey player who's sliding along at 7.5 meters per second? Stop. We want to stop him. So that implies that the final velocity class is zero, zero meters per second. And uh, it tells us he's sliding along on frictionless ice. Now that means for you to stop him, you've got to do it all by yourself. There's no friction helping you. Right? I mean, if Michael were sliding along the floor somehow, like he sat down on his rear end and one of you all pushed him along the floor, he wouldn't slide real far. Why? There's friction, even on a somewhat slick-ish surface like this, there's still friction. On the ice here, they tell us it's frictionless ice, so we're assuming the ice is not helping you. If you're gonna body check this guy, ever been to a hockey game? We know what body check is. Okay, if you're gonna body check this guy and stop him, Body check and hold the check for three seconds. How much force of your resistance has to be mustered up is the question. Now, we see here a change in velocity we are attempting to accomplish. Class? Good, a negative 7.5 meter per second change in velocity we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to accomplish this change in velocity in a time of only three seconds. And the mass of the hockey player. Hmm. Let them give us the mass. They give us the weight. So let's simply divide that by. And uh, oh, what's the mass of the hockey player? 90 kilograms. He has a mass of 90 kilograms. We need to change his velocity to negative 7.5 meters per second in a time of three seconds. The question is how much force has to be applied to stop it? Well, to find force, mass times change of velocity per unit time. Or you could say this will be the deceleration. You do F equals MA against the same equation. And uh, what do we get here, class? 225. Negative 225 of force measured in. Three sig figs or two sig figs? Ah. Two sig figs. About negative 230 newtons of force to stop him sliding. Do we see how to use it? Again, it really is still F equals MA. We're just defining the acceleration as change in velocity per unit time or change in momentum then per unit time for the force. Any questions on that equation? All right. Um, next thing in your notes. Conservation of momentum. Conservation of momentum. Let's imagine for a moment that the hockey player is sliding along the ice. Let's assume frictionless ice, so there's no outside force acting on him. It's just got its own force, just sliding along merrily. Or perhaps you could picture a Peanuts cartoon character sliding along the ice on the frozen lake as a Snoopy comes up, for instance. And uh, let's suppose then Snoopy 
hits the other person, crashes into the other person, before they both go sprawling to the ice with a little, you know, atomic looking thing above their head, right, seeing stars and stuff, um, there's a certain collision that occurs. And if the friction is out of the picture, then there's two people or individuals that both have momentum. There's the original ice skater and there's Snoopy. They both have a certain amount of momentum. And when they collide, their momentum is now, if you will, shared between them. But if there are no outside forces acting besides their own individual momentums, then the sum of the resulting momentum must remain the same as the initial momentum. If there's no outside force to change momentum. Does that make sense? If there's no force, there will be no change in momentum. The book uses this rather dramatic illustration. Imagine a, a stick of dynamite placed into rocks, like the fuse. How much momentum does the system have right now? Zero. There's no movement, right? Momentum is mass times velocity. There is no velocity, so there's no momentum. And suddenly, boom, everything goes up. We say, well, wait a second, now everything's moving, right? True, but an equal number, roughly, of fragments that go this way would also counter with fragments whose velocities go that way. So we have positive momentum and negative momentum. When you add it all up, you know what you stay with? Zero. Still zero momentum. Maybe a better illustration, one that you might actually see from time to time, is the illustration you see on the next page. You ever tried getting out of a boat that wasn't either tied up to the dock or wedged on the sand really well or someone holding the boat? So this guy, he goes to step out of the boat without tying it up. And if you've been on a boat, you know what I'm talking about. He steps forward. And as he steps forward, that results in forward momentum. But before he tried to get out of the boat, it's just sitting there. Momentum equals zero. And so if he steps forward to maintain zero momentum, the boat must go backward. And where does he fall? Right where he was standing to begin with, right where the boat used to be. He doesn't make it to the dock. The boat just goes out from under him and down in the drink he goes, right? This is why if you go canoeing with that special someone one day, <clears throat> Hold the boat still for, you know, tie it up to the dock, hold it still, make sure she can get out first. <clears throat> then you're going to find out how much she loves you. Ask her to hold the boat while you get out. Okay. <laughs> um, or some, somehow, some way, whatever that is. Okay. So I'm, I'm picturing, you know, pulling up to the dock. I just grab onto the dock. Okay, honey, you go and get out. Now see if you can hold the boat for me. And you try to get out. You, you may get out, but you let her get out first while you're secure the boat. Another example, ever fired a handgun or a handgun's the most dramatic effect, a long gun perhaps. Okay, if you fired a gun, you know there's this thing called recoil, or the kick of the gun, right? Why? Because when you hold the gun, everything is motionless, right? Zero momentum. And all of a sudden, this tiny projectile with minimal mass goes off at an incredibly high velocity, and that's a lot of momentum that way. And if there's momentum that way, there has to be momentum that way, and that's the kick. Right? That's the recoil of the gun, the gun maintaining zero momentum if all other factors are, are out of the equation. So whether it's, a, whether it's a rifle or a shotgun or whether it's a handgun, you're going to get that kick. Now, we're going to see this in a little bit with the math, but which has more kick, handgun or long gun, typically? More recoil, I should say, more recoil. Which one is harder to aim accurately because of the recoil? That might be a better way to phrase it. The handgun for sure. Specifically, if you've ever fired various handguns, you'll notice that the smaller, lighter handguns are the hardest to aim. Why? Well, because assuming you've got a decent caliber bullet leaving a hole in someone who's attacking you, or the target, because all you're doing is preparing to defend yourself if you should have to, you've got this bullet flying off with a great deal of momentum. That means there's momentum backward as well, right? Momentum being mass times change in velocity. Well, if you've got a really big gun with a lot of mass, then the backward velocity doesn't have to be that great to maintain momentum backward. But if you have very small mass to maintain zero momentum, you get a greater velocity backwards. So a heavy shotgun, I mean, you'll feel it, especially if you're firing like a slug or something with a lot of powder behind it, because you're getting a greater velocity out that end, but, or a greater, well, it's actually roughly equal mass of projectiles, just all in one wad. Uh, we're firing a long, a long bullet. Okay, there's a little bit more mass there, maybe a little bit more powder, but you've got a heavier gun to absorb, if you will, some of that recoil for you. So all of these are examples of this conservation of momentum. Before you pull that trigger, nothing's moving, zero momentum. After you pull the trigger, 
total momentum must remain zero if outside forces were present. Now, in reality, you're providing the outside force, aren't you? So when you hold the gun, you're bracing yourself to stop that recoil of the momentum so the gun stays straight. But if you watch some fool on YouTube who for the first time fires a gun and they hold it like they see in the movies, you know, and just pull it out and bam, and then their hand like flies backward. Okay, they weren't bracing themselves to provide any outside force. Or the poor little kid who pulls the trigger on the shotgun for the first time, and they're not bracing, they're not really up tight against the shoulder where the gun has some ability to move, and it hits their shoulder and dislocates. Um, <laughs> anyway, right, you want it tight against the shoulder so you're providing some outside force, but if there were no outside force, for instance, somehow imagine this, a tripod with a shotgun on it, and somehow you pull the trigger with a string so there's nothing bracing it, Obviously, when the gun fires, where's the shotgun going to go? <laughs> it's going to go flying backward, right? Um, now, again, it's got a great deal of mass, so it's not going to go flying nearly like the bullet, but it's still going to go back a good bit, right? If there is no outside forces present. How do we quantify it? Actually, I never had you write anything down for conservation of momentum. If net force is zero, if net force is zero, total momentum remains constant. If net force is zero, meaning net force acting on the system is zero, total momentum is conserved, or momentum is constant. Now, the same is true for an object that is in motion, right? If an object is in motion and there are no outside forces acting on it, it will retain that same, volt, that same momentum because of inertia. How can we quantify it? Well, if we were to take the momentum of one object, say object A, so the momentum, mass times velocity, and we were to add to it the momentum of a second object, call it object B. Before and after whatever interaction takes place, whether it's trying to step out of a boat, you have the mass of the boat, that's mo and you have the mass of the person. They both have whatever velocity they have. Maybe try to get out while it's moving forward. Huh, it's better than getting out when it's perfectly stationary if it's not secured in any way. Well, that mass and velocity sum of total momentum will be the same, assuming the mass hasn't changed, as the mass and velocity of the two objects, excuse me, after they've interacted in some way. So a really straightforward equation is just momentum plus momentum before equals momentum plus momentum after, where we use that prime notation. So m sub a, v sub a equals m sub b, v sub b, plus m sub a, v sub a prime, plus m sub b, v sub b prime. And there's our equation for conservation of momentum. Let's go and look at a couple of example problems here. Page 181, go ahead and read example 12.8, if you would. Kendall. Um, All right, it's rolling, so uh, the assuming no friction isn't too big of a stretch, because rolling objects experience little friction. So again, no outside force is present. We have a marble, and it's rolling along, and there's another marble that's sitting there. The first marble hits the second marble, and then uh, this first marble, once it collides, comes to a dead stop, and then the second marble begins to move. The question is, what is the velocity that the rest, formerly resting marble obtains? Well, we use this equation. First marble has what mass class? 40. 40 grams. And because we're going to be consistent with grams throughout, the grams will end up canceling anyway. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave the 40 grams times the velocity that the first marble had. Plus the mass of the second marble, also 40 grams, times its velocity as it sat there. Oh, so really the second object had no momentum at all, correct? All right, then we take after they collide, the first, sec first marble hits the second marble, and it says that the rolling marble, once it collides, comes to a dead stop immediately. So first marble, still a mass of 40 grams, what's its new velocity after the collision? Zero. Zero. Well, that means it has no momentum on the back end. But the first marble has a mass of... 40 grams, and the question is, what is its velocity going to be? Well, 
pretty straightforward. If you erase all the stuff that's gone, how do I get V sub V prime by itself? Divide away the 40 grams, and all it's going to be is, and this is why if two objects are of equal mass, if the first one's resting, the second one collides, if the first one stops, the second one will continue on. A couple of examples. Have you seen those little things with all the little silver balls hanging there? And you pull back one, and you drop it. And it hits, and it comes to a dead stop, and one marble shoots off. If you pull back two marbles, they collide, and two marbles shoot off. They all have equal mass. And assuming there's no outside forces present, and the, the, the cables from which they are suspended provide very little friction, then what's going to happen is whatever momentum is present at the beginning is the momentum that we'll leave later. Now, usually there's four or five in a row. Consider four in a row. You pull back three. When they collide, the last one will stop as it transfers its energy to the first one. The other two will maintain their momentum. And that's why you see three constantly moving. You've seen those demonstrations? Right? We could do the same thing if we took a bunch of kids out to the playground and we put them all in the swing set and we lined them up and we pulled back one and we, no, we don't do that. Okay, but anyway, don't, don't actually try that at aftercare, Audrey. Uh, but anyway, um, that's the base, one of the basic ideas there. But this, that's not a rolling marble. Where would we actually see rolling marbles where um, one comes to a stop and the other one kind of shoots off? Pretty popular game for recreation. Okay, playing marbles, like the actual marbles games the kids played back in the day. How about the games still played today? Pool, pool right? Billiards. Billiards or billiards or pool. Billiards or pool, right? We call them pool balls, but you know, basically the same idea, marble, right? So you have the cue ball queued up. It's the same mass as all the other balls. And so when you hit the cue ball, if you hit a dead-on shot to the next one, once the cue ball stops and the next one shoots off and rolls and hopefully knocks you know, up against something. There's all kinds of angles, lots of math in billiards, which you'd think I'd be good at it. No, I'm terrible. I, it, theoretically, I know how it's supposed to work. I just can't make it happen. Kind of like bowling. Like, I know exactly where the ball's supposed to go to get a strike every time, but somehow coming out of the hand, it doesn't always hit there, right? We bowling. Now, we bowling, that I can do, because all I gotta do, I know exactly where the ball's supposed to go. Just make sure that red line is there. I'm good. I got this, but real bowling, something between the aim and then the release. It's kind of like pitching in softball. I know where the ball's supposed to go, just, yeah, anyway. The hand-eye control is, just, yeah, anyway. But anyway, questions on that. Questions on that. All right, look at example 12.9, speaking of recoil of a gun. And uh, read that for us, if you would, Audrey. Uh, 3.2 kilogram rifle shoots 9.7 gram bullets. The muzzle velocity of the rifle is 850 meters per second. What is the recoil? All right, which it should be, but it's not. All right, so here we go. We've got a rifle. That's my first object. And I have a bullet. The bullet sits in the gun. And then we pull the trigger. And there's the gun. And there's the bullet. All right? Now, initially... The gun is just there, stationary. And the bullet inside the gun is likewise stationary. So how much momentum does the gun have at first? And the bullet? This entire side goes to zero. Make sense? Then we pull the trigger and action happens. First of all, the gun. Said it has a mass of what, Audrey? Uh, 9.7 grams. The gun? No. <laughs> 3.2 kilograms. 3.2 kilograms. So the gun weighs about seven pounds or so. Okay, so again, a shotgun or rifle, rifle in this case. And the question is, what recoil velocity does that gun experience? Finding V sub A prime. Make sense? And then we have the bullet. Well, the bullet has a mass of? 9.7 grams. This time, class, do you see I cannot use grams because I also have kilograms? One of them's got to change. I'll change the 9.7 grams, or Audrey will rather, into? Grams, uh, 0 .0097. 0 .0097 kilograms. And it says that that bullet flies out of there with a velocity of? 850 meters per second. 850 meters per second. All right, so to get the V sub A prime by itself, class, I'm going to have to do what here? Subtract this product to the other side, right? Make it a negative, so all of that moved over as a negative. Um, what would that be? Negative 8.245. 8 
and negative 8.245 kilograms times meters per second. Okay, so that's the momentum of the bullet. Or rather, it's probably positive, but let's refer it backwards. Just kidding. All right, and then we got to find the velocity of the gun. Now we will simply divide away the 3.2. And what do we get for the velocity, the recoil velocity of the rifle? Audrey? Yeah, 2.576. There we go. And round it off. Is it two stick figs, I think? Yeah. Yes, so we get? Maybe 2.6 meters per second. Again, if not held against the shoulder, the gun would fly backward, that's the negative, at a rate of 2.6 meters per second. So, assuming it, you know, if, if, again, if it were somehow on a tripod, it would probably only fall for about a second before it would hit the ground anyway. But it fly backwards about two, two and a half meters, maybe three meters in the time it takes to fall. So, uh, anyway, questions on that? Questions on that? So, again, hold it tightly and brace yourself for the recoil. Also, heavier gun. Heavier gun. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the heavier gun. You know these little handguns made of this like carbon composite or whatever. They're really light, easy to stick in your purse, but or you know in the, in the concealed carry spots. But I'm like, I don't know. You know, it's just harder harder to accurately shoot my target, especially when you don't get out and shoot very often. So yeah, I'd rather have the heavier gun that's going to stay put. Not that I'm lugging a shotgun or I just conceal carry that. You know, it's like your pant lug. <laughs> anyway, uh, I digress. Um, questions on momentum. All right, homework for this evening. You're going to practice with a few problems involving momentum and also read on through the end of the chapter. Read pages 180 to 180. Actually, you're not reading on to the end of the chapter. Read pages 180 to 182, reading about different types of collisions. Page 180 to 182. On page 185, answer questions 21 to 24. On page 185, answer questions 21 to 24. And do problems 11 through 14. Page 185, questions 21 to 24, and problems 11 through 14. We'll take a look at all of this in our next lesson. And when the bell rings, you'll be dismissed.